good morning, good morning. We have a great sermon for you here today, so I hope you all will stay awake and uh, listen to this little sermon. But it is good to have you all here with us this morning. Thank you all for coming. You know, we enjoy so many wonderful and precious gifts. And uh, I mean, you just have to walk outside. You can see all the gifts that God has given us in nature. Uh, the beautiful sunrise this morning. We saw the pinks and blues as the sun was coming up this morning. Uh, we have our families. And God has given us that. We have our church community. Our church family that God has given us. The wonderful and delicious foods that we enjoy every day. Our homes that give us warmth and comfort and shelter. Uh, we are so blessed. God gives us so many things. But... A lot of the gifts that we get from God, we don't actually see. Many of them we do, and we acknowledge God for those all the time, but a lot of times we don't acknowledge God so much for the ones that we can't see. Um, electricity. Well, God has given us that. You know, they know how to make it work, but they don't know why it is. They can't duplicate or figure out the exact reason why it works. But God has put that in. Gravity and centrifugal force. Those are the two forces God has put into motion is what holds us here on the planet. You know, if the planet spun just a little faster, we would go flying off. But the gravity holds us on and the earth moves just at right. And if the earth didn't move at just the right speed and it slowed down, then we would be crushed. So centrifugal force keeps us from flying off and gravity holds us in and neither one of them crushes us. And every day we ought to thank God that he set all that in right motion. And it's a precious, wonderful gift. We can't see things like love and joy and peace. Those things that we can feel. These are great gifts that God gives us, but we can't see them. But this morning, I want to talk about another gift that God gives us. Uh, one of those that we can't really see. And we're talking a little bit about that because we use this one every single day. It's the gift of time. Time. You know, God created time. If you look back in Genesis, all the way back at the very beginning, Genesis 1.14, the Bible tells us that then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. You see, God set all the sun and the moon and all the planets and everything in orbit and all in motion to give us time. You imagine how hard it would be to keep track of what you had to do or where you had to go or what you needed to, where you needed to be if we didn't have time that God gave us to orchestrate. If there was no light or darkness, no day or night, we wouldn't be able to figure out what what's what. You wouldn't have hours. You wouldn't have minutes. You wouldn't have seconds. You wouldn't have any of these things because they're all tied into the, the sun and the moon and the stars what God has given us. So he created all these things to give us time. And notice that was before mankind was here, time existed. God then places us within the box of time. And that's where we live our lives, in that teeny tiny little box of time. And it's what orchestrates everything that we do and when we do it. Time. It really confines our human experience within it. You know, one of these days, the Bible says that the heavens and the earth will pass away. There won't be no more sun. And there won't be any more night. There won't be any more time. But, today, it certainly is a factor in all of our lives. That's how you knew when to be here this morning, because we have time that when we were going to start. And if I do well, and the little clock doesn't lie, we'll know what time I'm supposed to stop. See, everything is based on time. But if you look at it a little bit bigger picture, our life, our human experience, our life, is that period in which we travel in that little slice of time that God has given us. So let's think of our lives as being time travel. We always think about science fiction movies, but we all experience time travel. 
It's that period that God has given us in the overall spectrum of time. He pulled off a little chunk and put each one of us in our own little slice of time travel. And it's a gift that God has given to every single one of us. Now, just because it's a gift from God doesn't mean time travel, life, is always easy. I mean, even if the best beef tenderloin you can buy still requires a little chewing. So, yeah, time is great, but it takes a little work. It's a little tough at times. It can be difficult, and maybe it's because of two reasons. And the first reason is you never know about the unexpected stops and delays along the way. They just pop up. You know, if Marsha and I decided we were going to go down to Atlanta and visit the grandkids and spend some time, I'm going to tell you, I have to confess, I spend about the entire week before we go planning and scheduling Marsha's doing this and orchestrating, getting everything like man. I tell you, I'm checking the weather. I am planning what time to leave so that we will get through the the large uh, uh, cities and not have to go through them at the time when their people are getting off work or going to work. That'd be the worst times to be commuting. And so I'm organizing that and where we're going to make our stops and how long we're going to stop. And I'm planning all of that. And then I'm organizing the packing. You know what what luggage is going on and what pack and what gifts, yes, we're visiting the grandkids, there will be gifts. Get how all of that is going to be able to fit into the car because we have a limited amount of space. They got to pack that little cooler so we have like a little drink to have on the road with some little snacks. We got to organize so we have that located so we can reach it in the back and it's right, right there. We don't have to stop to get on. We can keep on moving. And then to make sure that the gas tank is full, and then the last thing, i got to punch it in the GPS so that I can watch all the way down to exactly how many minutes it'll be until I get there. I have done everything to make that time travel as orderly and as efficient as humanly possible. But it doesn't always work that way. Because there could be stops along the way. I mean, I could do all of this stuff we could be five minutes down the road at a stop sign and somebody rear end us. Wham! Next day, instead of me being down in Atlanta, sitting at the kitchen table, coloring with the kids, and doing jigsaw puzzles and eating some good old southern food, I'm in traction up at the hospital, poking around, trying to figure what that mystery meat is that they serve for lunch. You see? There are stops along the way that we can't plan. And we don't know when they're going to happen. And so it makes our time travel a little more difficult. Unexpected stops and delays. But there's another reason why time travel, our lives, can be difficult. Well, it has a lot to do with the amount of stuff that we try to take along with us. Think back when we used to take the kids down to the Outer Banks and go down there. Oh my goodness, three kids, one car, mom and dad, suitcases, tote bags, ice chests, blankets, beach toys, blank I mean everything else you can think, all piled into that car. Man, we are going to take it all with us. The house is almost empty. Barely could fit the people in by the time I got all the stuff in there. It made the travel pretty difficult. You know, life is kind of like that. So we travel through our time travel through our lives. It is amazing the amount of things that we accumulate. Well, I mean, spouses, in-laws, kids, grandkids, for some of you great-grandkids, we get all we collect all these responsibilities that we have to take along with us all the time. Uh, maybe it's uh, in your job. Uh, certainly we have responsibilities in our family, uh, in our church, in our community. All of these things, get, we have to carry all these with us all through our time travel. We also gather up a lot of other things along the way. We got all of our plans. We got all of our hopes and our dreams and our ambitions and we keep piling that stuff on and we're carrying that. And then there's a lot of other burdens that we carry too. We have financial obligations that we pile on top. We have health issues. 
emotional disappointment, physical addictions. I mean, it goes on and on, the amount of things that keep piling on top of us that we have to lug and carry with us as we're doing our time travel here on this earth. So time travel, life, can be very difficult. There's so many unexpected turns. There's a lot of roadblocks, a lot of detours. And I don't care how carefully you plan or you pack, more and more stuff is going to get piled on for your journey. And you've got to deal with it. So these two issues that deal with time travel affect our opinion a lot of times of the destination. Sometimes all of those things cause us to take our eyes off of where it was we were going in the first place. It affects our destination. Today, our scripture today deals with this concept of time travel and the destination. Now, it's a familiar character. It comes from the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, turn to Joshua. Joshua, we're going to start at the very, very beginning of Joshua. Like I said, very familiar character from the Old Testament. And old Joshua's finding out that time travel's being a little tough on him as well. Uh, all these uncertainties and all the burdens that he's carrying with him are starting to weigh him down. And he's beginning to lose sight of the destination. And so God wants to talk to Joshua a little bit. He's going to talk to us too about dealing with time travel. So again, have your Bible open. Look at the first Joshua chapter 1, first eight verses. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the soles of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Now, well, Joshua's time travel, his life has had a lot of ups and downs. It's been pretty difficult up to this point. You have to imagine that the first years of his life, uh, he was uh, among the Israelites who were under bondage in Egypt. And so he had suffered through all of that, you know, making the bricks and all of those sorts of things and the harsh life that they lived in. And, but then when God came and redeemed the people of Israel, and you remember God redeemed them by the blood that was on the doorpost, the picture of Christ coming, and enable them to then be saved and then leave and do all oh, Joshua. Man, I'm going to tell you, he got redeemed. He saw all the great plagues and saw God's miracles. He saw the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, he saw when Moses you know, hit the rock and it split open and water gushed out. He knew every day he could walk out and see the manna that God had provided. He saw so many miracles that God had provided as well. Hardship, miracles. But now he's having a problem again. Because if you remember in your studies, Israel didn't really want to do what God wanted them to do. So they spent the last 40 years wandering around in the desert. It's been a tough life. Always having to run around, 
washing their backs, being attacked by raiders. And for 40 years, old Joshua washed as all the people in his generation, except Caleb, all died off. And now, even Moses was dead. God's spokesman, God's prophet, the, their, their leader and their mediator is now dead. Now, Joshua knew all about the destination. You remember that land of milk and honey? They had all heard that he'd even been over and seen it when he went out and spied it out earlier, 40 years before. But now, Moses is gone. Everybody he grew up with is dead. And there's a couple million people coming to him every day with the burdens of all their problems. Looking for his direction, his leadership, trying to get him to answer all their questions. He began to wonder about the destination. It's so hard with all these burdens. And, and even if we do get there, how are we going to survive? He'd already seen their fortified cities and seen the armies of those who were over there. How would they survive? How, what would they eat? They wouldn't have time to plant, you know, farms. You just don't go in and start planting a farm and getting stuff out the next day. Those, yeah, a bunch of y'all have little gardens. It takes a while. You've got to till the ground and fertilize and plant and hoe and take care of it and seed it and water it. And then, in a season, you'll get the fruit. And how in the world would they even plant and do these things if they're busy fighting? He began to take his eyes off of that destination. And how in the world do you think, am I supposed to divide up this promised land amongst the hundreds of thousands of families that are following me. I don't even know a hundred percent sure what the boundaries are. It was easy that great sea to the set where setting the sun, that's the Mediterranean. But, and then the other's a river, but the land of the Hittites is actually, where is that? How do, how do I divvy all this up? How am I supposed to make all of this work? For Joshua, his old time travel seem destined for failure. I don't see any way I'm going to be able to pull this off. And even his destination had become a little uncertain. You know, sometimes we can feel the same way as we go through our time travel and we get to all the little obstacles that seemed very big at the time. All the heartaches, all the little detours, all the disappointments that we experience. But God gives to Joshua and to us the secret of successful time travel, which is how to live a successful life. And it really is simple because God starts it off by using the word only. It's in verse 7. God says only. He says, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this and this and this is how it's going to work and it's going to be successful only. Oh, that's pretty simple. It's just all you got to do. It's only. And God says, it's just three things. All you have to do is three things. Know my word, meditate on my word, and comply with my word. Really simple. This will give you everything you need for your time trial. First of all, he says, know the word that I gave to Moses. Know that word. Moses has been sharing God's word with Joshua. You know, for about 38 years, Moses has been writing all this stuff down. You know, when he died, it was all there, all written on the scrolls. And so for 38 years, he's been writing it down ever since they got out of Egypt. He's been jotting all this stuff down. And we know that he's been telling Joshua because God told him to tell him. In Exodus 17, 14, Exodus 17, 14, God told Moses to take his word, write it in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua. So God says, here's what you got to do. Here's the first thing. You got to know the word. 
You've got to know the word. You know what word? The, the words that I gave to Moses. The words that I told him to write down. Get the book out and read it. You can need to make sure you know what the word says. Read it. Keep reading it. Keep studying it. So that you don't get off track. You see, that way you don't go to the left. You don't go to the right. He's not talking Republican or Democrat. He's talking about just getting off the right path. He said, but you got to know the word. Or else you'll stray. Make sure you know the word. You know, when you know God's word, when you know it, and you read it, and you study it, and you meditate on it, you know it will answer every question that pops up in your life. And people say, oh, that was written a long time ago. We got high tech stuff, and we got this, and we got... Uh, and it's true. If I have a question about credit card debt, you know, I get my concordance out, and I look through, and I can't find credit card in there nowhere. No matter how much I look. But I'll tell you what, there's plenty in the Bible that teaches me about being a good steward. I just have to know the word. I can apply it to any circumstance in any situation. But God says if you want to live a successful life, if you want to have a good, successful time travel, first thing you have to do is you have to know the word. You have to be so familiar with God's word that you can use it in any circumstance during your time travel. And that leads us to the second instruction, second thing that God said. He said to meditate on his word. He said, I want you to think about it. Know my word. I want you to think about it day and night. He said, do not let it depart from your mouth. Uh, we would say that differently in our, our speech today. We would say, you know, you need to chew on it a while. Okay, don't let it depart from your mouth. You need to take my word. You need to think on it day and night. You need to chew on it a little bit to make sure you understand it. Because knowing God's word, that's a head thing. Okay? Meditating is what takes it to here and puts it in your heart. How do I use what I've learned? How do I, how do I use what I know to be true? How do I apply this to this, to my life? How can I use this? And that takes us to the third thing. And the third thing, the third instruction God says, is to comply with it. Comply with it. Whereas Nike would say, just do it. Just do it. Know it, think about it, meditate it, apply it to your life, and then when you get all of that, you get that plan, do it! Twice in this passage, God says, be careful to do what my word says. Be careful. Make sure you do it. Not just read it, not just think about it, but then you got to do it. How to apply it is different than applying it and obeying it. And God says, and if you will do these things, if you will know my word, if you will meditate on it and figure out how to apply it to your life biblically, and then you do it, he says, you'll be successful. That is the secret for successful time travel. Folks, we're all traveling through this little slice of time that God has carved off for each one of us. And for God's part, He has already taken care and provided the destination. So we don't need to really worry about that. Unless you're not saved. But if you're saved, God has already promised Given us, like he did Joshua, a promised land. Notice that God's part is already done. God has already handled his part of the deal. Even in here, when he's talking to Joshua and talking about the promised land, in verses 2 and verses 3, twice, he says, I've already done it. And once he says, I am giving you the land, here it is. They haven't even got there yet. Here it is. And then he says, I have already given it to you. So God's part is already done. We stop worrying about that. We just need to worry about our travel and how we're going to live our life. Worry about our time travel. You know, God has already given us a promised land as well. It's the kingdom of His Christ for all who have placed their faith in Him. That, that's already done. But 
as much as God has done his part, we have our part to do. And our part is to work our way through the days, through the weeks, through the years, towards that destination. And making that time of travel a success. And we do that by knowing his word, meditating on his word, and obeying the words of God. As they have been given to us, sent in the scriptures. And that's how we know that our life, our time travel was successful. Not easy, not comfortable, but successful. When we live our lives that way, according to those three instructions, remember God said, the only thing you got to do is that. That's all you got to do. And when we do that, that's what makes us more like Jesus. It's what conforms us into his image, who completely obeyed those three instructions. And so when we do that, we become more and more like Christ each and every day. And that's what God wants for all of us. He wants us to be successful in that regard. That's that process we call sanctification, one of the big fancy words that we use. And it means being conformed uh, from being changed from this way into Christ. Well, how Christ lives and his attributes and his character and it's a process that we go through and that's what God wants for our lives in 1 Thessalonians 4 3 he, it says that this sanctification it is the will of God God wants us all to be successful in our time trial but it's not always easy it wasn't for Joshua and it isn't for us and that's why God also said, but be strong. Knowing that in our weakness, our strength comes from Him. And be courageous. And we can be courageous because God can do all things. And He says, and do not tremble. And do not be dismayed along the way. For the Lord your God is with you. Wherever we go. The example of Joshua is something that we can take heart in. He led and was leading a very difficult life with a lot of obstacles before him. And God knows how difficult things can be. And each one of us has had periods in time where we've had disappointments and roadblocks and detours. And our time travel has been interrupted, it would seem. But God knows everything. And he said, what may seem like a failure to you can be successful. Just, just know my word. Just meditate and figure out how to use it in your life each and every day and do it. And be conformed to the image of my son. And this is my will for you. And when you do that, you'll be successful. And we do it knowing that we don't do it alone. We praise God that we never go through our trials without having him travel with us. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what you bow with me as we pray. Lord God, we just thank you for your word. Lord, and we thank you for the time that you have given to each one of us. And Lord, we do thank you for the so many blessings that we enjoy along the way. But Lord, sometimes our travels are hard and difficult. We'd ask, Father, that you would help us to know your word. And teach us, Lord, to use it to guide our steps each and every day. Lord, may we travel well, bringing glory to your name. Amen. God bless you.